So three people who are very much involved in LA politics, very much involved in infrastructure, the development of infrastructure in Los Angeles because of their individual roles, but also their, their uh, willingness to uh, be engaged in the uh, civic dialogue. So um, let's get started. Did we say Cindy? Who do we? Okay, you, you yeah, said let's go, Cindy let's go with Let's go with uh, Councilwoman Misikowski. Okay. Uh, thank you, and it, it's really great to be here. And I really um, have been impressed when I look at your uh, weekly schedule and what you're going to be trying to tackle here in learning about infrastructure. <clears throat> if tonight had a different title, I think I would have called it Mega Infrastructure because talking about the Port of Los Angeles and the airport, you're really, really talking about the delivery of goods, not just in the city of Los Angeles, but in the whole Southern California region. And a lot of people think of the airport, and you think of it's just a place to travel, and it's important, and we like to have a good airport system. But a little known fact, if you stop to think about it, you think of the big Port of Los Angeles and see those ships and the the massive amount of goods and cars and cargo that are brought in, and you think that's got to have a huge impact on our economy. But do you know that at LAX, what is brought in in the bellies of the airplanes equals in volume the economic value of all that is brought in at the Port of Los Angeles. So Los Angeles World Airport is not just a place for passengers, although it is the, the, you know, important in that regard, but when we talked about modernizing LAX and dealing with LAX and needing to accommodate something, it wasn't just for future growth of travel and, and passengers. It was really an important uh, underpinning on a mega scale of the infrastructure uh, of our region. Southern California as a region is the 11th largest economy in the world. And that is sort of startling in terms of its impact. And I will talk a little bit more about the LAX plan and specific uh, elements there. But if you stop to think of it, those of you who might be history majors, when you talk about the great cities of the world historically, um, generally speaking, they were always located on an ocean, on a river, on a port. Because great cities became great cities because they became an entry and also a place where goods could be exported. In the, um, in the earlier centuries in this country and elsewhere, an important part of uh, being a great city was being on another transportation system. And obviously, uh, through the, the 19th and 20th century, the growth of the railroads, both connected to a port and then connected outward, were important. And so too, when we think about it, the airport, even though it's a one stationary place, is a critical, critical element in terms of mega infrastructure in the region to cause goods and to come in and goods to be exported that service not only the region, but when we really look at, at LAX and the Port of Los Angeles, what comes through here, particularly from, from the Pacific Rim countries, doesn't just come and stay in the South, Southern California area or the, um, the state of California. It comes in here and goes across the country. So infrastructure on the scale you're talking about, you really have to open your minds because it is really a very, very large scale and not just within a context of neighborhood concerns about the impacts, although that is also important and we have to keep that in balance. So I just want to put that out, you, out there for you to start thinking about it in the large scale and look forward to some of the questions. Dennis, but hey, why don't you first tell us, why isn't your brother coming next week? I don't know. What's that about? Is this on? Yes, it is. I don't know. If I were him, I wouldn't come either because he gives, you know, he's, I feel sorry for him. The guy's like four against one every debate. Uh, gives these other guys an hour and a half to pile on him. Uh, it's easy to criticize, so that's all they do is criticize. I don't think any of them come up with anything uh, good to say except to criticize my brother. So why would he want to, you know, you got to invite him by himself. We'll do that. Get him by, him by himself, let him come and talk, you know? Yeah, so, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to have four guys spend, the, spend an hour and a half nailing you. You know, every time I invite him, he just makes fun of our team because he went to Pepperdine. I know. <laughs> That's true. Although, we won last, the last time. I know. I know. So I know. You, yeah, my whole, you, family you, went, my whole family went to Pepperdine. Oh, we're sorry. I know. <laughs> yeah, my, son, my son, Mark, is a junior at, uh, at Mal, at, uh, in Malibu right now. 
And my daughter graduated from there in 2000, so. <laughs> now, my parents met at Pepperdine, uh -huh. so. My dad was a history government teacher, uh -huh. and uh, my mom was a student, and uh, in fact, that's how my dad first, uh, I know, oh. really. Oh, <laughs> dad is <laughs> any job openings at Pepperdine. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if they had strict uh, rules in those days about professors and students. But uh, that was the first time my dad, uh, that was how he, he first ran for office. He was, a, he was a government teacher at Pepperdine and he was always talking about how to get involved and, you know, get involved in politics and his students said, hey Mr. Hahn, you know, you talk all the time about running for office, why don't you run for office? And uh, he said, he was 26 at the time. Right. And he said, okay, I'll make a deal with you. He said, uh, I, if you, uh, you can have a choice. You can either work in my campaign and walk precincts, or you can write uh, you know, a 10,000 word theme on how to get elected. And he said, if you walk a precinct and I win that precinct in the election, you'll get an A in the class. Wow. So they all opted for working in his At election. that time, uh, Pepperdine was in South Central LA. Yes, it, it, was, it, it was not in Malibu. Right, it was in South Central LA, Vermont and uh, 79th. I'm sure you couldn't do that these days, like say you get an A if you walk precincts, but. You know, <laughs> <laughs> weird. I know, I know. Let's, let's try it. I know. Yeah, yeah. No, how actually, many They actually have to go do precincts. Really? Yeah, we do a, 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 a survey of uh, precinct quality and they all, on uh, Tuesday the 8th, they'll all be out there. So, Very good. Yeah. So anyway, he won. They all got A's. He was the youngest uh, man ever elected to the city council. He was uh, 26 years old, and that was the Then story. he went to the Board of Supervisors. He was in elective office for over 50 years. Yeah, right. Yeah. So An icon in uh, L.A. politics. Yeah. But your uncle was also... My a uncle was a city councilman and an assemblyman. So it's in, it's in our blood. I'm the first girl, Han, to ever get elected. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your district and the harbor, and what are the issues over there? Uh, as was mentioned, I, uh, I was elected uh, three and a half years ago. Uh, on the same night, my brother was elected mayor. So what victory party did your mom I, go to? Oh, man. It still hurts. She went to his victory party. And he'd already been yeah. elected like five times. I know. To deal with that. I know. It's my first time. Whatever. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> But you know, she's, she's, she's on my side most of the time, so if I ever have a dispute with my brother, I call my mother, and she, she's on my side. So have you ever voted against your brother on the council? Couple, couple times, couple times. Like, what was it about? Couple times, well, uh, let's see. One, uh, one of the times was uh, actually the burglar alarm issue. Uh, the police department, I, Cindy and I were on, the, on opposite sides on this one too. The police department decided that they were no longer going to respond to people's burglar alarms. Uh, that they had to, they decided there were too many false alarms in the city of LA. And they just couldn't, they, we, are, we, have, we have limited resources um, in the police department, as you all know. So they felt like they were wasting a lot of their time chasing after false alarms. I thought that was a, a bad idea because I thought that sent a bad message to the criminals that uh, starting tomorrow, we're not going to re respond to anybody's burglar alarms anymore. And, unless, it was verified. And so we said, well, how does that get verified? Well, either you're on the phone saying, yes, there's a person with a gun at my head, or your neighbor can call in and say, I verify that somebody's being robbed. My favorite thing, you must admit, Cindy, this was a good moment. <laughs> we packed the city council chambers when we took the vote on it. And people from all over the city came to testify. And my favorite was this, this senior citizen from Watts. And she got up to the podium and she said, I'm against this new policy. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a single elderly woman and I have a burglar alarm. And you want my neighbor to verify whether or not I've been robbed? She said, last time I was robbed, it was my neighbor. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so we were on opposite sides on that. Hey, what, I should, what, what happened, just on morality, Paul, what happened yesterday with the uh, cop tax? Did, both of you voted for it. Yeah. 
We both supported it, and we needed 10 votes to put it on the ballot, and the vote was 9 to 6, uh, so we had 9 votes to do it. Uh, very, very hard fought, very emotional day. This is saying, should we put a, should we ask the voters whether or not they want to look at a half cent sales tax increase for more police officers throughout the city, and more firefighters and paramedics, and a, and a percentage of it to go into gang intervention uh, community kind of programs. Uh, it, it's similar to what we asked the voters for in the county in November, and in November, if you separated out the city of Los Angeles vote, 64 percent of the folks in Los Angeles who voted in November said yes. Now it needed two thirds; it needed 66 and two thirds. But we thought if we did a better, focused, real, energetic campaign in LA, we would get that. And I think many of us felt that 64 percent saying yes was a mandate to try again. So we pushed very, very hard with a lot of efforts. So a lot of our neighborhood councils said yes, we want to give the police chief the option, and we weren't saying tax, we were saying let's go to the voters and let them decide, Fire let the system. chief and the fire chief and the firefighters and the police officers in the city go out and debate people for the, with the, and let people be engaged in a debate for the next two months and vote on this in May. What was the position of business and the Chamber of Commerce on this? Um, you know, generally business interests oppose taxes as a general rule, or at least they're very tight on taxes, but our chamber is a little bit different. It's, 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 kind of, it's much more of a progressive chamber. It's about half Democrats, half Republicans, and it has taken some controversial stands in the past. And on this one, uh, we voted to support the sales tax uh, with a, some conditions. One, we wanted an oversight committee that they've got. We wanted business people on that oversight committee, wanted uh, a 10-year sunset provision to allow a review of that in 10 years. We thought that would also help in passage of it. Right. Um, so th what you get in the business community is a fear that these monies are going to be somehow re-diverted or diverted to, a, to other general Which services. they could have, theoretically. But there's a provision in this particular one, uh, one that is pretty tough on maintenance of, right. of effort that's already existing. Um, you can never protect that 100%, I think, but this was pretty good, I think. So this was going to generate $200 million annually. Uh, we were going to be able to hire 1,200 more police officers. We were going to ha we were going to be able to train more paramedics. We were going to get 24-hour ambulances in all of our fire stations, uh, and and we were going to spend 30 million uh, for uh, anti-gang programs, after-school programs. And you know, people ask me, you know, and it was tough and it was emotional for me. But I'll tell you what, I had a bad day today. Uh, you know, you, people wonder kind of what we do in our job. Uh, at one o'clock. I attended a funeral, Michael Gutierrez, he was a 23-year-old uh, in San Pedro. Uh, he was a personal trainer at Bally's. He just became a dock worker, uh, w one of three sons, uh, great parents. And uh, he, it was a party at his house in San Pedro. And uh, uh, one of his friends showed up with a, a tattoo. He wasn't a gang member, but he was like honoring his dead uncle who was a gang member. And there was a rival gang member there who uh, followed him out to his car to, to cause trouble. And Michael, being what everybody says about him, just this kind of a peacemaker, and uh, tried to go out and protect his friend. And, and this other guy opened fire uh, and shot and killed him. Then, which was, was so sad, then at 3 o'clock, uh, I was invited to sort of a, a uh, immediate gathering of a neighborhood, also in San Pedro that I didn't know about, but a 15-year-old was shot and killed there last yesterday, uh, just on the corner, going to the grocery store, and uh, somebody walked up and said, hey, where are you from, which is what a gang member says right before they open fire. And they had a little shrine there today. His mother is just like sobbing on the flowers. The sister was sobbing, the whole neighborhood, kids, you know, and they're all looking at me going, yeah, what, what are you, you, you going to do, do about, about this? <laughs> they're all... And, and Michael's family was, so, was mad at me, and they said, what are you going to do about this? Well, what are you going to do I know. About well, part of what I wanted to do about it, was, part of what I wanted to do was offer people in Los Angeles the opportunity to pay a half a penny on a purchase, three, so you know, every, one, and a half, dollar, one and a half cents on a, on a Starbucks latte, uh, three dollars on a double-double, a uh, dollar fifty on a DVD player. That's what I want to do. Give people an opportunity to pay a little bit of money every time they bought something, 
so we could hire more police officers. We could have gang intervention workers, which I think both of those murders could have been prevented. Both of them, if we'd had more police officers and more more gang well, prevention just, programs. Is LA just too spread out, though, to have effective p policing as the way we... Hey, do? we have 9,000 police officers in Los Angeles. You know how many New York City has? 40 thousand police officers. We have 50,000 registered gang members in LA and we have 9,000 police officers. So <coughs> I, I don't think it's too spread out. I just think we need we need a lot more officers. Right. I, I think that's the answer. It's not a question. I mean LA is part, uh, our culture has been a laid back Southern California. We didn't need like the coast, or we never thought we needed like the big east cities, uh, this big cities back east, uh, lots and lots of officers. But we clearly have gotten too thin. When we, you know, if we, back in the 70s, LAPD, they're, they're, they were called the thin blue line, meaning they were thin, but they were strong, and they were proud, and they could do it. But today, we've gotten too thin, particularly, not, not just geographically, but in dealing with what we're dealing with, with, with the gang situation. I mean, by and large, generally in neighborhoods in our city, Things are safer. We've got high morale. We've got a, a great police chief who is getting the job done. We've got senior lead officers who work with the community. But the department recognizes that right now dealing with gangs is a multi-level, multi-type uh, uh, of problem that isn't just police officers, but police officers need the community intervention people. We need the programs in schools, particularly in the middle schools and high schools, to intervene. Uh, and get kids uh, off the street and making choices at an earlier level so that they make the right choice and not get in. Gang, the gang system in, in this region is a culture, and it's a culture that starts early, and that's why we need the companions of, of intervention and, and, and community-based organizations with the police. And again, as we, we were just asking, give the yeah. people a chance to vote. Give give everybody the chance to tell those stories that Janice is saying or the police chief told yesterday or the fire chief yeah. yesterday. We had, I mean, when Janice talks about a bad day today, I had, a, a, I just had a reaction today of being very, very sad because mm -hmm. the, the potency of what was said yesterday, very often council debates and debates on matters, uh, they can get heated, but they don't get really to the heart of something. Yesterday we really got to the heart of something, and if I ever had a thought that words could have persuaded people of the importance of the vote, it, it was put out there yesterday. It was. And that's why today, rather than being angry or frustrated, I just felt sad mm -hmm. because today. You're still the chair of uh, the public yes, safety, I'm, right? So I'm chair in of charge. public safety. So from and the council, again, she's in charge of the police. And, and, and today, one of my responsibilities was to meet with community leaders about policing in Los Angeles, not about more police, but as many of you may be aware, the city of Los Angeles. Um, since back in the in the late 90s in the Rodney King incident and the concern about how we were doing policing in the city and whether or not the police culture was treating some people, particularly minorities in our community, differently than we would like to have them treated. Uh, we are under a consent decree. We have the federal government saying, let's make sure that LAPD is doing the job that we want them to do and doing it rightly and with respect. Uh, so my meeting today was with the community organizations looking at how we can better improve the situation of LAPD and the communities it needs to protect and serve and respect. And uh, because again, it's, it's, as you can see, it's a complicated system. We want more police officers, but on the other hand, we need those police officers to behave in accordance with standards and understanding of the communities that they're policing. Uh, and the police chief said yesterday that part of that will be made better uh, if we had more police officers. Yeah. When you send a very, very few number of officers into a situation where they themselves may be afraid of a situation because they don't think they've got a lot of backup, they know they've got to handle something sort of singularly or maybe with just their partner, they may make some choices and uh, some issues that are adverse in terms of the way that may be seen. They may not be the best of, of uh, implementation of the training they have. And so with more police officers, there is more of a sense of comfort in the police officers that there will be back that they can handle things more comfortably. So it's a very, very complex situation. But as I said, yesterday we had an opportunity to have the voters weigh in and help address this situation. And unfortunately, because we only had nine votes rather than ten, we were denied the opportunity to have that debate and dialogue with the public. 
George, maybe a comment or two about this before we go back to uh, Janice in the harbor. Well, I was going to just, we talked about culture of, the, of gangs, and, and one thing that's clear about the Los Angeles Police Department culture historically has been that, and it's changed a little bit over time, but not enough, is that, that the culture has been a military culture because of the small number of police. And so what you do in that kind of a culture is you make the police the tough guys on the street, and, and that's, that's part of the culture of the LA Police Department. And uh, it may seem incongruous to some, but it actually works, as Cindy was saying, you increase the number of police officers and you make it easier on them. You, don't, you change their role also from being simply military enforcers to being like in New York where the cop is, is as likely to walk you across the street and give you a direction and talk to you yeah. uh, as they are to arrest you. And, and that relationship that develops over time and that confidence between law enforcement and the public uh, is so, so important. You can't never have enough police to cover. You, you require the, the, the engagement of the public in that. And when the police department is a threatening force, it creates more suspicion uh, than, than cooperation. So uh, that, that's one of the reasons we supported it, and, and the chamber has, has always supported uh, increasing the size of the police department. Hey, just one more question. I have to ask you this, Janice. How, how do you hang out in the city council with two guys who are trying to take your brother I out? Know. I know. I mean, as a council member, you had to go bump into him when I walk by him. <laughs> no, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I, you know, I try to remain professional. <laughs> no, it's, you know, it's, it's tough. It's tough having uh, two of your colleagues uh, really trying to take out your brother, so uh, I try not to make it personal, but uh, it's it's hard. I glare at him a lot. <laughs> I, I, I'm just gonna ch chime in on that. It's interesting because well, why don't um, you talk about your husband and the fact that he's oh, endorsing the? Uh, oh, 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 yeah, what's we'll that go about? To that. <laughs> Keep yeah. listening. But, See a commissioner who just but, decided for, to endorse somebody else. As Janice has talked about it, and it's clear that I have endorsed uh, Jim Hahn, but at, at all the debates particularly talking about police, at, at the different um, mayoral debates, and I've seen a number of them, yeah, you said that. all the candidates say, oh, yes, we need more police officers, and don't worry, I'll be able to provide all the police officers we need and not raise any new funds. I'll just be better at the job in terms of using our funds efficiently. And, and Jim Hahn is the only one who has stepped up and said, no, we've tried for four years. Mayor Reardon tried for eight years before that. No one, even in times of plenty, has really been able to build the force the way we would like to. The only way we'll be able to do it is really find a new guaranteed stream of revenue. And, and as I said, all of the other candidates, including our two colleagues, said, yes, I'll, don't worry, I'll do it. And that's what they say in the debates. Yesterday on the floor of the council, neither of them spoke up. Yeah. Neither of them got well, up and said, they didn't they say said anything. nothing. They voted against it, right? They, they voted, voted against, against it, them. but the others, and there were others who voted against it, who got up and said, here's what I think and here's how, and got, in, got involved in the, in the debate. So I thought it was a little disingenuous that we had two colleagues uh, who are out there telling the public and saying one thing in a political campaign, and yet on the floor of the council, when it was the time to persuade, step up, one way or the other, they could feel and vote the way they want to, but they should have participated in the debate and told us all in council and to the media uh, that was listening in the televised debate where and how they were going to do it. I and that's agree. what I, um, you know, I think we should have perhaps a little bit of a, like in maybe uh, agree? Dr. Gary <laughs> could be uh, personally I what I would like to see in the debates. And one of the things that might be interesting particularly is you have the debate here next week. Well, the students will be able to ask questions, so this is one of the but questions. But one of the things you want to do afterwards is if it would be really great if there were sort of like the, the truth squad on the debate. Because an awful lot, and we all know this, at least Janice and I have been in political campaigns, and sometimes people say a little bit, and might be a little bit more of a demagogue in a campaign and make promises, sometimes that they even know they can't keep. Right. Because you say things to a crowd at the time you're trying to persuade them. So I always thought it would be useful to have in all the debates sort of the little tr truth squad on the side who hadn't endorsed anybody, but just said, you know, sort of the truth squad about don't let the candidates get away with saying something that sounds good but, yeah. but isn't true or can't be effectuated. And that's, that would be useful, I think, in this debate. And if anyone is looking at setting up a format, having the little truth squad person at the end would be <laughs> I think right really idea. useful. Yeah, we're going to have some TV reporters and journalists there asking the first uh, hour. But after the second hour is for the students to ask questions. So that would be great. That's good. All right, the harbor. Oh, this is more fun. Don't you think talking about all the <laughs> The harbor. 
Well, you know, again, my council district uh, stretches uh, all the way north to Watts, and then I take in Wilmington, Harbor City, Harbor Gateway, and uh, San Pedro and Wilmington. And Wilmington and San Pedro are the communities that have historically uh, felt very negatively impacted by the harbor. So when I took office three and a half years ago, I came in realizing I was representing uh, really the economic engine all. Sounds like the, the cargo and the planes rivals what comes in, in the port. But really, one certainly of the economic engines, not just of Los Angeles, but all of Southern California. We have 13 million containers uh, that come through the port complex of Long Beach and Los Angeles. That accounts for about 42% of all the cargo that comes into America comes through our port complex. That's why the 710 is so busy. That's why uh, the 710 is so busy, the 110, the 60, the 15. I mean, the, the amount of cargo coming in and then needing to get on the back of a truck or a train and leave uh, the region is enormous. And the growth of the international trade industry is amazing. It is not slowing down. Even though whatever happens in terms of the economy uh, for other industries, the international trade industry is booming and it continues to grow. Without doing anything, it's projected to grow by, in 15 years by, by triple. So if we're getting 13 million containers annually now, do the math. Uh, it's phenomenal. And, but I, I took office realizing that, you know, that's so important. I mean, that represents uh, so much of our economy. In fact, a couple years ago, uh, I lived through uh, a labor dispute at the port of Los Angeles and the, all the West Coast ports. Uh, and the longshoremen were locked out, which means they weren't allowed to come work for 10 days. And this was a, a, a port shut down that, most people kind of figured was coming because the labor disputes, their, the contract was up, they weren't coming to an agreement. So a lot of the shipping companies knew that was happening and took their, uh, their goods to other ports. They made other arrangements. Uh, but in that 10 days, they were able, the economists were able to quantify uh, exactly what uh, the port does contribute to our economy. And they said every day that the West Coast ports were shut down, uh, we took a two billion dollar a day hit to our economy nationwide, not to mention how it impacted the global economy. Uh, I was in Asia at the time with, with the mayor and, and some others, and we were visiting Korea, Japan, China, uh, and the business people over there were extremely worried about the shutdown of the West Coast ports, and it already had begun inf affecting their businesses. In fact, we have heard since then that there were certain businesses in Asia that never recovered from that 10-day shutdown. So clearly, that was a way that we finally could really quantify what it, what it meant to our economy. But when I came into office, I had some very unhappy people that lived in San Pedro and Wilmington. And they were actually, uh, if any of you remember the secession movement a couple years ago, where there were certain parts of Los Angeles that were so unhappy that they wanted to be their own city. Uh, and they actually put it to a vote of the people. Wilmington and San Pedro wanted uh, to be on that ballot and become their own city, but they were unable to qualify for the ballot uh, because it was deemed they, they, it w wasn't viable for them to be their but own San city. San Pedro was a city at one point. San Pedro and Wilmington were both cities at one time. In 1909, this is where that little shoestring comes in. In 1909, uh, the city of Los Angeles realized that if they were going to have control of uh, one of the seaports uh, in this country, they would have to incorporate Wilmington and San Pedro uh, into the city of Los Angeles. So they put it to a vote of the people, uh, and I think it, it won, but the city of LA promised Wilmington and San Pedro about 10 things if they would join the city of Los Angeles, and I think they reneged on nine out of the 10. Uh, but they voted, they joined Los Angeles, and. Los Angeles had, you have to connect, it has to be contiguous, so they had to connect this little shoestring, which is now the Harbor Gateway uh, area that goes, connects it up to Watts, uh, so, it, so it connects to the Harbor area. But they were a city, but they were so unhappy because they felt like this economic engine, which was contributing billions of dollars to the economy, um, and certainly provided generations of these great jobs on the docks, 
but they felt like they never really benefited um, in, in their community from, from this money. Their streets were worn, there was blight, uh, they didn't feel like they had the kind of services from the city of Los Angeles that other, other parts had, and they felt their quality of life was really compromised. They had the dirtiest air, uh, they had the most trucks on their streets, uh, Wilmington particularly, uh, you have that many trucks trying to get in and out of the port of Los Angeles to pick up their loads and, or, or drop their loads off. And, you know, many times they are badly behaving trucks and they take streets that they're not supposed to take and they, they literally go down streets that say no truck traffic because they're, they're trying to save, save time. And it gets so congested uh, at the terminals at the port that time is money to these truck drivers. So they literally drive through streets, they drive in front of uh, schools. We have pictures where they've driven on sidewalks and completely crushed them in the community of Wilmington. So they were really asking me, you know, let, let's find a balance between always talking about the growth, the economy, this economic engine, and could we, could we balance that a little bit with the quality of life that we have, have to live with because we live next to the Port of Los Angeles. So my brother and I really, Who's your, who's your brother again? Yeah, the, the mayor, Jim, oh, yeah. Jimmy. Uh, the, uh, we, la we launched this very aggressive uh, mission where we, ins we really worked with the Harbor Commission in the Port of Los Angeles to say enough is enough. And my brother s actually said no new net increase of pollution will happen at the Port of Los Angeles. Well, that was a pretty bold thing to say. I mean, when I just said it was going to triple in growth, and yet he said, okay, we're going to grow, but I don't want any more emissions in the air. So we actually, we've actually done some amazing things. One of the most uh, historic things we did, and this is what I'm hoping ports all over will begin to build in their infrastructure, is we, his, for the first time in the world, we plugged in a ship that came into the harbor in Los Angeles. And every time a ship comes in and is at berth, uh, they have to keep their lights on. They have to keep the engines running because a lot of them have crews that are still living aboard. They have to unload the containers, they have to eat. And every day that they stayed in berth and kept their, their lights going, they burned seven tons of this uh, bunker fuel. So just when they're idling there in just port, when they they're idling. seven tons of, wow. And every, and now that we, and so we, we worked with China Shipping. It was a historic <coughs> memorandum of understanding where they retrofitted their ship so it could like, I mean, this is like not a technical term, but you know. They took an extension they cord. They took an plug. extension cord. Uh, and we retrofitted the berth where they, where they came in so they could actually plug into the Department of Water and Power's electricity grid. And they have, again, they've quantified that every time a ship plugs in to the harbor in Los Angeles, it takes away the amount of emissions that 16,000 trucks daily would contribute to the air. So that's a great roadmap uh, of how we, how we cut pollution. Um, the other thing, and I know that we're going to talk, but let me just say the one other thing that I'm also pushing for in terms of I infrastructure you know, we can't handle this growth. We're not widening our freeways. We're not getting any money from the state. We're not getting a lot of federal transportation dollars. Uh, a lot of the people don't want to see us widening freeways because we take their homes sometimes when we do that. So I've been pushing uh, and, and was really a champion on why does the port operate eight to five? It's, it's just crazy to me. You have an economic engine that accounts for 42% of the trade, comes into this country, and let it, it operates eight to five. So all those trucks have to converge to get their cargo in and out of there in an eight-hour day. Have you ever been on the freeway at, in the middle of the night? You know, well, yeah, sometimes, they actually, they sometimes there's a traffic jam in the middle of the night. Yeah. But m mostly it's not as used or on the weekends. So... I'm pushing to have our port allow the trucks to come in and pick up their stuff in the middle of the night and on the weekends. Was it a union issue or is it? No, it was, you know what it was? It was an issue that they all, everybody told me, Janice, it can't be done. Why? Because it's never been done. 
And you would have to get the shipping companies together, the labor together, the warehouse distribution owners together, the, tr the truckers together. And you know what? I got them all together. And I put them in a room. And I said, look, I know you've never done this before. I know there's a million reasons why you can't do it. But you know what? The public is fed up. <laughs> the public can't drive on the streets anymore. We can't drive on the freeways anymore. One overturned truck on the 710 freeway shuts down the freeway for like four hours. If you want to talk about efficient goods movement, mm -hmm. you've got to start using our infrastructure 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's the only way, in my opinion, right now, we can, we can support this kind of growth. Eventually, we need more transportation dollars from the state. We need more federal transportation dollars to, to widen our freeways. So are they uh, operating 24-7? So uh, this program will actually start uh, this June, uh, we're going to be operating both ports, 20, uh, well, they're going to be operating off-peak hours. They're going to be picking up the cargo Monday night, Tuesday night, Thursday night, and Saturdays. So I feel like that is a huge victory uh, when everyone told me that it, it couldn't be done. But I think in about uh, 10 years, we're going to look back and wonder why all the ports didn't do yeah. it a long time ago. So. How about a quick, quick comment on the Alameda corridor? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, the Alameda Corridor, uh, we had a meeting this morning, and uh, we got a new update, and uh, we've got, uh, we're, we're, let me just tell you that we have daily, we have uh, 43 uh, trains a day, and we're carrying 5,000 containers daily. A lot of people think the Alameda Corridor is underutilized, and people hear that all the time, but it's not. It's right on track, pardon the pun. Uh, this was a $2 billion uh, public works uh, uh, project that was built to accommodate the future growth of both ports. So we don't really want it to be at capacity right now. We want it to uh, be able to grow with the port. So it's growing. We need to extend it uh, farther out uh, in, in the east. But right now, uh, it's running uh, well. What I'm pushing for is more on-dock rail and more near-dock rail. Because the best scenario is when those containers come off the ship, they should get right on the rail um, and not be trucked uh, even a little ways uh, to get on, on the rail. So how that's what you, I'm pushing How for. many of you have ever seen the Alameda Corridor? Very few people. So. But you know, the other thing the Alameda Corridor did, a lot of people didn't realize, besides carrying that cargo um, out of here, uh, it's had a great impact environmentally. Uh, we got rid of 200 uh, train crossings in Los Angeles. You know, people don't realize it right now, but a lot of people aren't stopping for trains anymore. It used to be sort of a daily occurrence where the traffic would stop for a train and idling cars do what? Add pollution. Uh, we had uh, terrible instances where trains would stop a long time around a school and kids would actually climb through because they didn't want to be late to school. Sometimes trains would idle like 40 minutes in one place. So we've, we've done a lot to improve the environment uh, with the corridor, which a lot of people don't realize. There is a chapter in your book on the Alameda Corridor, on the uh, Steve Erie book, and also it's basically a subway for trains that move goods. Right. It's a 10-mile trench down underneath the street that uh, takes the trains and the car goes out. George. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be here with these two uh, leading uh, political folks, and they've taken a big lead in, these, in, in the port, the Alameda Corridor, and the airport. Um, I want to uh, comment on a, on a few things. I know that this course also deals in large part with the dynamics of county, city, and, and um, regional government. Uh, so I want to sort of get into that. But first of all, to emphasize the importance of trade, there's no doubt that this, if there's an international city and a new international city in America, it's this one. And it will continue to be the most international city in the United States. Therefore, its dependence on trade will start to mirror what other cities in the world have done with trade during their lifetimes. This country, being isolated by two oceans at least, has for a long time existed with trade among itself. And the emergence of trade for the United States, and California and Los Angeles in particular, is another example of how the world is coming closer, but also how this country is going to be more dependent in the future on goods coming in and selling goods overseas. So some statistics about that are, are, I think are important. Uh, California economy, we know how big it is, but $90 billion in exports alone in 2003. It's the nation's top exporting state. LA is the leading city in the US 
in the value of imports and exports combined with a total of $235 billion in 2003. California itself is home to three of the four largest container ports in the country. And the LA Long Beach port is ranked third in the world in that regard. The port of LA is responsible for 259,000 full and part-time jobs indirectly. Uh, and um, one out of every 24 jobs in Los Angeles is connected in some way to the port of Los Angeles. One out of every eight jobs in Long Beach. So you see what that is in terms of an employment base for this uh, city. But it also, think about it, when goods are manufactured in downtown Los Angeles, clothing exported out, goods coming in, the clothes you're wearing, the food, some of the food you're eating, it's all coming through these tremendous gateways to the rest of the world, making taking advantage of the international city that we have become. So the importance of trade is huge and becoming bigger. Chambers generally support growth of business, sometimes to the detriment of the environment. Uh, our chamber has tried to take a balance, but since the, last, since the 19th century, this chamber was involved in the establishment of the port, the establishment of the airport, bringing water to Los Angeles, some of the biggest enterprises in the city. And we're trying to reestablish that role again as trustees for the welfare of the, of the region. Um, but sometimes we get caught up too much in growth, and so we, it takes leaders uh, uh, like Councilwoman Hahn to, to set us on the right course in balancing some of these things. Um, I do want to raise what I think are some of the fundamental questions mm -hmm. from the structural point of view. And that is, how do we reconcile the regional, state, national kinds of interests? Because 43% of the goods coming in the United States are coming through that port um, and that airport. How do you reconcile that? And the corollary question is, who should make these decisions, and how do we organize ourselves to get what we want? Um, I'm going to push the envelope a little bit the other way, uh, with uh, having Janice having reminded you about the difficulties in the port. And I think of the movie Casablanca, where uh, how many have seen Casablanca? You know, at the end of it, the cop turns and, 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 and he says, I'm shocked to find that there's gambling in this establishment. <laughs> wink, wink. I'm reminded also of the Malibu Hills where people build on the side of the hill. The hill comes down. They say, oh, my God, why didn't you tell me I couldn't build on this slippery <laughs> hill? Anaheim tonight. Falling the ports down. were here. The port was here. The ports were here. The airport was here before a lot of these people. And to some people, they assumed a certain amount of risk, if you will, in, a, in, in, in living where they lived. So that's something that is presented by people who talk about growth and a little disappointment about uh, people who move into an area and say, oh my god, nobody else after me. Uh, I'm stopping it right now. Now, here's an interesting thing when you think of the airport in Los Angeles. It serves about 15 million people, uh, you know, in the region, 10 million in the county plus, and it, it covers about four or five counties that absolutely use this international airport. Um, now, if we were starting an airport, we said, God, we've got to have an airport. We've got 15 million people. Who would we decide own that airport? In some way, you'd say the 15 million people who use that airport might own that airport. There are 88 cities in a 10 million county of Los Angeles. One city owns that airport. One city makes those decisions for the entire region. But more than that, one council member has more influence over that airport than anywhere else because the structure of government in Los Angeles has local council members largely responsible for what happens in their district. Now, not alone, certainly, but when you think of 10 million, 15 million people using a regional asset controlled by one city of 88, controlled largely by in one council district, but even more so, controlled by those people largely, like you all, who live around it. Now, on the one hand, you've got to look at the environmental impacts of all of this on these people. But on the other hand, have you structured government to represent the needs of the region enough? Or have you weighted it in some way so that those people who are feeling that local pain of that airport, do they have the right balance of impact on decisions that are made at the airport? Now, that airport is growing, stopped after 9-11, but it will grow again, and we don't have very many alternatives. As much as people like to talk about regionalism, we're going to push that, but it's not going to solve the entire problem. So that airport's got to be redesigned, and thanks to Cindy Misikowski, a kind of moderate position was reached 
on that. But frankly, people were limping towards that conclusion in the end, and it took the mayor and Cindy coming together and finding a compromise that sort of takes care of the immediate future. But the question underlying that, who's making these decisions, and are, they, are the right people making those decisions? The same thing can be said of the port. Uh, the port of Los Angeles, uh, oddly, at the end of that string, um, is Los Angeles still. Uh, but it serves the entire region. In fact, it serves the country. And the funding that was, got, that was had for the Alameda cor Corridor was got in part from the federal government, both in terms of loans and grants. Also money charged to the railroads that run it. And the argument we made, because the chamber supported it, and my law firm actually represented the Alameda Corridor in Washington on it, was that it was serving the whole country. So you got to pay for this. You got but the decisions about that and the port are made by one city, and largely even more so there, one councilwoman who has to take and balance that herself and get reelected to a district to two terms, and that's it, and then she's out. So are you saying this is good or bad? I think it's trouble. I, I so think it's, it's trouble, trouble that they are in charge. I think it's trouble that only uh, a, a small number of people have such control over national, regional, state assets. Now, can it work? Sure, because nothing's ever perfect. And what Janice has done is to try to balance these issues and, frankly, control her constituency while solving the problem. But the federal government, for instance, at the airport still has tremendous amount of influence. Ultimately, the, the federal government can ultimately tell L.A. to expand this thing. Could they no, not? No, the federal government, can, all the federal government can say is you can't shut it down. And, and the truth about LAX is an interesting dynamic is right now LAX, we know how it's configured. We know for the last 10 years people have been trying to plan for it. Under Mayor Reardon, the previous administration said, LAX needs to grow. Right now, we, we, the, one of the measures of, of what uh, an airport is, how many million annual passengers it has. And LAX today has had in the range of about 61 to 64. 64 before 9-11, it's back up to about 61 now. The question is, how big should it grow? In the Mayor Reardon era, they said, we're going to build a new, modern, bigger capability LAX and let it grow to 98 million passengers. Again, in the days he was talking about, it was at 60. So talk about a huge expanse and think of the 405 and think that, that what that would mean. Um, big campaign in the year 2001, and all the candidates for mayor said, I will not support any expansion of LAX. All the candidates including, said that. Including Mayor including Hahn. Including Mayor Hahn. Now, was and he, what, but what going, it meant. Going back to George's point, though, was he saying that just because of the local trying to get elected? Right. I'm looking Every, at national interests? No, it was, the national interest had no concern about the national interest. In fact, the chamber has supported, generally speaking, the Reardon plan that said LAX is an important regional um, infrastructure and it should be able to grow. We should have regionalization and there should be appropriate growth everywhere. But even at growing LAX to 98 million, it was not absorbing all the capability or the capacity for the region. In any case, fast forward, 2001, um, new plan is put on the books and Jim Hahn's plan said, I will stand by my pledge and not grow LAX to more than what it can grow today. So the question is, here we were at 60, 61 million. But if we do nothing at LAX, do nothing, don't build a new terminal, don't fix a road, don't add a gate, uh, what, what could you pack in there? And that statistic is it could grow today, if we do nothing, to 78.9 million annual passengers. So the argument was, since it will grow that way anyway, if we do nothing, if we walk away from LAX, it will grow, the airlines will continue to come, the cargo will continue to come, and we'll all grumble and, and gripe and be stuck in traffic, but we'll still come here because we want to travel. Um, so the question is, at that 78.9 million mark, could this airport be made better? Could it be made safer? Could it be made for, more efficient? Could it be made more passenger friendly? Could it deal with all the TSA security kind of things that we need to deal with today? Could we eliminate some of the traffic? Could we build a people mover? Could we connect the MTA a green line to it? Could we reduce pollution by way of a lot of things? Could we make it safer just by, by separating some of the runways? Our two runways in the two systems that we have don't have a center taxiway. You look at any of the other major airports throughout the country and throughout the world, and for safety purposes, you like to be able to land and get that air, particularly if there's dual runways, you like to get the plane off the main runway onto a center place before it crosses, because sometimes air pilots 
will cross and think they're in a in a, uh, a center taxiway and they're really on the second runway, which is very dangerous. So yeah, you don't want to scare them, but pilots consider LAX the most dangerous airport in the world. From, from that perspective, so forget the exterior. So enjoy your next travel. <laughs> <laughs> so in any case, that's what um, we did. We we came in with a new plan, and but 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 George is right. There should have been a debate on the large scale for mayor of Los Angeles, and the majority of citizens here should have understood the perspective of the business community and said, we've got growth. If we stymie growth in the region, if we don't allow the port to grow, if we don't allow the airport to grow, the region is going to stagnate. Not but just you know what? But I'm going to ask you to let me continue. Yeah, well, no, you, you talked about us making the decisions, man. Well, okay, I'll get back <laughs> to right. let, let, Let's have George finish. As long as women are making decisions, I think this city is going in the right way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, the point I'm making, that, uh, and I think that Cindy confirmed, is that Jim Hahn, when he ran for mayor, and I supported him and support him now, and all the other candidates had to run to a constituency around the airport. Right. Because they were running for mayor of Los Angeles on an issue that was hot for that area. Had they been running in a region to talk about the airport, the pledge would not have had to been made. What Cindy Misikowski was able to do with the mayor was take a bad situation and deal with it. Under the, but the box that they put themselves into because of the politics mm -hmm. and the structure of the government, right. I think, prevented them from making the right decisions. One more example of that, I think, on this sort of academic side of this discussion is, is to take a look at, we have two ports right next to each other, the Port of LA and the Port of Long Beach. They together, we talk about them as the largest when we're trying to pump ourselves up. But they're two different ports run by two different cities serving this region. They actually, over the last 50 years, have competed for business with each other. Mm -hmm. They have competed to grow. Mm -hmm. It's one of the dumbest things in the world if we were starting anew in a perfect world, which we're not. We wouldn't say, let's have two ports, put them, let's cut it in half, put two ports right next to each other, have them compete so the shippers do really well, and let's make sure we keep building so we can handle it. And so they go, one F builds, a, builds a facility, the other builds a facility, drive them in, and here's where some of the absence of care in the community occurred was the growth of those two ports. So why wouldn't you have a, the other, the other thing is that the port itself, you know, they, by the fact that they compete against each other, they drive their own lease rates to these shippers down. I mean, they don't, if they had a monopoly, like the port of Hong Kong or Hong Kong or Singapore, they charge what they wanted. They deal with it. These two have to fight with each other to get a, a shipper to work, use their port. Again, a structural issue. Will LA ever give up the right to control that port? No. Will Long Beach probably? No. Now we say no. But for you, for a 50-year look, that's where we should be going. Can the, state, can the state force them together? I don't with know state that. Legislation? I think the state could. Mm -hmm. probably do it if, the if, if you got together get the state to vote for it or require The state could have done something else on regionalism, which it didn't do, and we didn't sure. do. It could have come down and had an, a statewide initiative forcing Orange County to use El Toro as a regional airport. Right. I, I remember Butcher Ford campaign organization came to me kind of late and said, should we do it an initiative that forces Orange County to do that? And I scratched my head and I let it pass. The truth is, in retrospect, it should have been a statewide issue mm -hmm. about what Orange County did with that great piece of land and put all this pressure on this airport here. So these are structural problems that you know, are not going to be solved by a council member today who has to deal with reality and make the airport work or make the port work and solve the. But for students uh, you know, and looking at tomorrow's leaders, that's the kind of thing I think we ought to be I gotta, I gotta <laughs> talk here. I gotta talk here because I, I take great issue with that. And in fact, okay, what's the issue? I, I, I'll tell you what the issue is. I'll tell the, you, issue. Uh, the, uh, the issue is, you know, if left up to business, it would be only about growth, 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 economic engine, economic engine. And Who's I, and I would venture to say, or some other person controlling. Uh, besides the local council person who Who's that? who is was elected to represent the people, and I venture to say I've been able to put forth what I think is probably the most innovative uh, project ever to come down, which is the, which is extending the gates. Uh, you know, the industry never thought of that, 
And I would venture to say. They thought of that, but it was inconvenient. It was it not going to work. I would venture to say the one thing that will drive business away from the airport or the port is not some environmental policy that I'm pushing or some way to balance the quality of life of people that live around there. It's congestion. It's congestion. Because growth without planning just makes congestion and more trucks and worse freeways and worse traffic. Uh, I would say uh, that it's, and you know, about leasing, you know, I'm happy to say that, you know, it's not just about the bottom line. It's not just about how much money you get from a lease for a port tenant. I am so proud of the Port of Los Angeles, thanks to my brother and me. We did the first RFP, request for a proposal, to lease a terminal based on who could be the most environmentally progressive tenant. And they, they did it on that basis, not on the basis of who could pay the most money, who could have the most containers, who would pro provide the most growth. They based it on, hey, we got to change the way we do business. We got to look to the future, and the future means you got to figure out how to have both. You can have clean air, and you can have jobs and, and, and economic development. And that's where I think it takes a local elected per person who maybe needs to get reelected, but looks at issues other than just the bottom line. Because I think looking at the bottom line and growth and, and money uh, doesn't necessarily provide for you know, a, a, better, a better project. Yeah, and in fact, I, I think it's been, you know, it was Dick Reardon who came in with the port and said, we got to be number one. In fact, at the time, Long Beach was number one. Okay, well, but then, but then, then we got to let George talk after as, this. As, 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 with the problem in we got to make LA number one, it was we got to make LA number one competing with Long Beach. And that's what I think George pointed out. That was silly to have these two things competing with each other. Long like ago, to, had, had there been a monopoly and had LA been able to charge, or Long Beach, whichever, had the entity been charging, but with the local council members saying, you can charge whatever you want, but 20% of that is going back to the community to fix the roads, to fix whatever. The problem is because they competed and lowered the price rather than raised the price, they were always just in this business of the port rather than the business of the community. That's where the local person needed to be part of it. But they can't have but, those funds go back to the community. Like, we can't use the funds to right. for cops or but you for... But you can, you can do it in some way. First of all, the share, the fair share on the community has to be a portion. So the policing of the port, you know, the police can pay that share of it. Uh, but you can also find innovative ways, and Janice has been in the forefront of that, of improving the quality of life around the port, improving the condition of the road affected by the port. So you can, when you create the nexus that the port is having this impact on the community, you can do that in addition to all the other pollution things. But on the other hand, when, when George was talking about LAX and, and the state perhaps stepping in and preventing El Toro from being, from being lost, we also had another great avenue in the federal government that El Toro base was a marine base, a federal entity, a military base. What is the entity that governs flight in the country? And what is the entity that tells us we can't shut down flights at LAX? A federal government, the FAA. The FAA precludes us from shutting it down. The, I believe that the FAA and the federal government should have stepped up and said this is a federal piece of land. The region needs federal uh, airport. And we're going to force it on LA County. Uh, LA, Orange. Uh, excuse me, Orange County, and Orange County could have then participated in how they wanted it planned, what the environmental safeguards should be, what kind of buffers there should be. But I think George's point is that, and I'm sure as you're looking at this, we have a rather chaotic governmental structure. For those who believe in local control, we have absolutely wonderful local control. But augment that by term limits which says many council members don't stay, can't stay for more than two terms. It's very hard to get your hand around honoring and supporting and dealing with the issues of your neighborhood. And every election comes down to what's going to happen in my neighborhood, what's going to happen to the quality of my life in my neighborhood, and yet taking the step back and looking at the big region. So the question is, were we to start with a clean slate and do things, we would do them differently. And those, stu those students who study regional government can come up with great theories about how it should work here. But the problem is the reality is what we do have to work with, how we make it work, and where we should, should change the balance if needed to make sure that those two things are always in a healthy but understanding tension of one another. That is the neighborhood and its concerns and the region and its concerns. Because every, every neighborhood is part of the region 
and needs it. I mean, whether it's housing, and you know, we talk, Janice is right, you have to deal with planning as a basis of that. It's interesting, we, we hate traffic in this region. We know we're failing miserably on traffic. I just read a report. In the last decade, our population grew by 4%. Our vehicle miles traveled grew by 40%. So people say, oh, there's too many people here. That's what's dealing with the traffic problem. We aren't too many people. We are too many people traveling individually in a car, and we're not well serving the system in terms of providing the traffic and the transportation system around. And the only place people can find housing that's affordable is further and further out, so they have to travel more and more miles back into the region where the jobs are. That's what's out of balance. George. I, I think Cindy said it very well, and, and my comments really stem less from being chair of the LA Chamber of Commerce the last two, two years, but from my own experience and, and love of structure. Anybody who spends time doing charter reform is, is some kind of a nut, frankly, uh, for structure and, Speak and for process. Yourself. process. <laughs> but I spent a lot of time doing that, and that's where, where I'm coming from. As Cindy said, it's not a question of business. It's not a question of what business wants. Putting that aside, it's how do you structure it. People who have power always want to retain power, and they've got to solve immediate problems. Mm -hmm. So that's what they should, that's what they should do. Um, so I think it's just something to be thinking about. How do you match up decision-making with needs? And it's not something that's going to occur very quickly, but I think the state is fast approaching a kind of a crisis about government, about how you don't, who's your assemblyman? Who's your senator? Who's your congressman? Who's your councilman? What role do they play? Who do you blame? Who do you hold accountable? These kinds of questions are at the heart of government working, and it's difficult to know in Los Angeles uh, who to blame. Well, if you listen to the debates, we blame uh, Jim Hahn. <laughs> <laughs> but see, I was on the elected charter commission, and what I worked on when I reformed the city charter um, was trying to get local empowerment of Neighborhood. neighborhoods. But that was another level so, of government. That's I don't think so. To say no. So, I, you know, I, I worked to make sure that the city charter uh, mandated that a network of neighborhood councils be so, uh, created throughout the city of Los Angeles. That's all about this book. So if you had one, George, one more, what other reform do you think that the city, I mean, I know we went, just went through charter, charter uh, commission and the whole thing, but is there one reform? I, mean, I know there are no magic bullets out there, but one that would be helpful more than any other? Well, I, I don't know that there is, but I would say, say this, that people ought to be ready. The city is, is required under the charter to review the charter in terms of the neighborhood councils, which will open the charter up to a fuller, because all, when you open it up, people want to change other things, police mm -hmm. uh, issues. Well, when will that happen? Oh, well, those guys are already It's required to, to happen in, in no later than 2006. Wow. Uh, that this is and what's the process reviewed. for that? Will it be the council? Will it be? The process is the same as was uh, divine for the appointed commission. And that is <laughs> that, the, uh, that the mayor and the council members, Janice, will be able to appoint a representative. Uh, the, the city controller, the city attorney, and the mayor will appoint three. So there will be 21 members of an appointed commission that will be charged with coming back and recommending changes to the charter. Uh, they, most, it's, it's, fo it's required to do that with respect to neighborhood councils. Right. There were those people who thought that neighborhood wow. councils did not go far enough. Mm -hmm. that they should have voting authority and, ba and basically be s small governments in their community. There were others who thought that creating neighborhood councils in itself was going to create a mess of nimbyism. In, a, in essence, both sides were worried about where this experiment was right. going to go. And uh, so we put in a provision, es essentially, that made them both happy, which was a five-year review. So people who thought it should be more power for neighborhood councils could come in at that point, people who thought that they weren't working and they were becoming an impediment. But let me point out one other major policy decision that was made that was stopped by a local government. Now, this is not quite the same situation. There was a time when the, uh, the uh, metro system, the subway system, was going to run from downtown along the Wilshire Corridor all the way out to the beach. It would be done by now. Now, just picture getting on that out here, going downtown, stopping at the county museum, where you would have persuaded the Getty Museum maybe to move if, if people were there. But you've now built up a corridor that is not only great for tourism, theaters, the rest of it, but links the entire part of this city um, downtown over here. It was stopped because one community didn't want it coming through. And an excuse that was used was the same excuse that was used to stop Belmont at one point in time, which is underground gas. 
and it was stopped. One person stopped it because of a community that didn't want people coming through their neighborhood on a subway. A huge policy error for the city. Who, what was that community? Who was that yeah, person? Beverly Hills and that's uh, uh, Waxman. Congressman Waxman. Congressman Waxman. 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 Yeah. And, you know, um, that's not the same issue as we're talking about structurally, but it shows that there is a danger in NIMBYism mm -hmm. that affects everybody far more than it affects the people who are living there for a short time. If you take up, what the, who is it, Jeremy Bentham or some of the greatest good for the greatest number, <laughs> and you Jeremy. match that up, was that the greatest good for the greatest number? No, it was not. And, and yeah. just the one, one thing I'm going to say on that, and, and the point is, when we, we talk about NIMBYism, not in my backyard, is this colloquialism. Well, some of us say not Indian, Mexican, black, or young, but. <laughs> <laughs> never in my, well, not, never in a million billion years is another one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, no. <laughs> Um, but the, 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 the point is, uh, how, do we, how do we bring it together? How, how do we make, uh, and, and whether we do charter reform at the local level, the, the real serious effort which, which should be taken is sort of a, a city restructuring reform perhaps from the state down. And, really, and, and, not, it, and I see the blending, the perfect blending is the idea of local neighborhood controls and the neighborhood councils with a much stronger regional government letting the local powers, the local neighborhoods deal with issues on the scale that really are neighborhood concern, but saying that some things are larger scale and really should be done on the regional basis, not by a district, not whatever, across these 88 city lines. I mean, here we are, LAX, and the city is city of Los Angeles, which serves the whole region, is, is in negotiation, if not litigation right now, with the city of El Segundo, the city of, of Inglewood, uh, and all the cities right around LAX, even though the majority of those cities, the people who live there, have a really high percentage of their jobs. El Segundo got built yeah. on the aerospace industry because of its association with the airlines that were LAX, and yet El Segundo is now suing LAX because they share that border. Uh, we hope we can negotiate all of that, but, but that's, that's the problem in terms of this impact of, of how do we balance you know, that. But I do think the LAX and the port, I, I think as they move forward, um, they do have to pay attention to, uh, to the impact that they have, the negative impact that they have on the surrounding communities. And I love the fact that in this uh, LAX master plan, we've actually negotiated this unprecedented $500 uh, million dollar community benefits package where we're going to be doing things like soundproofing uh, people's homes schools. And, and schools and, yeah. and things that, you know, we probably should have done anyway. When I, when I look at the Port of Los Angeles and, and you worry about NIMBYism, but if you don't pay attention, one of the very interesting things that happened in San Pedro uh, again, this was the era of the port saying, we're big, we're bad, we're moving forward. And uh, they began to build um, a terminal for China shipping, which is where we just had that historic <laughs> plug-in ship. And their EIR, uh, according to many, were, was less than truthful. And that's sort of what I've always been saying. Look, the EIR is an Environmental and, Impact Report, and yeah, the definition the, of it is in your book, by the way. And you have to you have to complete one of those before you uh, you know build something. And uh, one of the things I've always been saying is I'm not against growth, I'm not against projects, but tell the truth, tell the truth about the project, and then tell the truth about what it how it's going to impact me, and then we'll figure out how we can mitigate it. Tell me the truth on how much more emissions is going to be in the air. Tell me the truth about how many more trucks that's going to bring to my neighborhood, and then let's talk about how we can mitigate that. Well, they decided to ignore the complaints from the community, the homeowners groups, the, the, the people that were getting angry, and they said, no, we're the big bad port, we're moving forward. Well, a little homeowners group in San Pedro sued uh, the Port of Los Angeles and said, you cannot go forward building this terminal because you haven't told the truth in your EIR. Uh, and uh, one judge uh, agreed with them, they appealed it, uh, and ultimately a judge agreed with the homeowners group that the port, in fact, uh, did not tell the truth and was moving too quickly. Uh, as a result, they told them they could not build this terminal until they did a, a, n a new, complete, truthful environmental impact report. The community then decided to get into a settlement agreement and it was a, a lot of very interesting talks and negotiations. But as a result of that, the community said, we'll let you build this terminal if you do 
all these things. And they agreed to do things like uh, have 70% of the China shipping ships uh, ultimately plug in, to have vehicles that, that drive around on the docks use alternative fuel that wouldn't mess up the air. Uh, invest in low-profile cranes. Have you ever been down to the port? What's a low-profile crane? And you see, well, like have, you ever, have you ever been down to the harbor yeah. and seen the, the port, the giant cranes in the air? A lot of people, I mean, it's in the eye of the beholder. Some people think they're beautiful. Uh, but some people think they block the, uh, the skyline. In fact, we just lit our bridge down right. in San Pedro, the Vincent yeah. Thomas Bridge. You've got to come down and see it. It's great blue lights. But the irony is, from a certain point in San Pedro, you can't see it because of the cranes. So there's actually a manufacturer in China that makes a crane that, that goes this way instead of this way, so it doesn't block the skyline. Anyway, one of the things the community is saying, let's at least look at doing things that doesn't completely mess up our, our view. And the other thing was uh, the Port of Los Angeles has to pay $60 million uh, to mitigate uh, what they tried to do and, and what they ultimately will do with that project. Uh, 20 million is going to go to uh, help with, with uh, clean engines for diesel trucks. Uh, 13 million of it is going to be spent right directly in the community. 10 million, uh, 23 million, 10 million in Wilmington and 13 million in San Pedro directly to the community to sort of pay them back uh, for the negative impact. So my point is, you know, it seems to me it's a better idea on the front end uh, to tell the truth, to listen to your neighbors, to listen to the community, to listen to how your operations are impacting them, and then work to mitigate those in an honest, truthful way. Because I don't care if the port moved in, was there first, or the airport was there first, everybody, I think, has a right uh, to live in a place where they can breathe clean air and not be impacted by truck traffic. I mean, every, that's all people have is where they live. And some people would argue uh, that they can't afford to live anywhere else. And some people who live in Wilmington can't just pick up and move somewhere else because, because it's, it's, it's not a nice get, place to I'm live. Get, so. um, get George to comment, but then we're going to open it up to the students right after that to ask questions. So, George. I fully agree with Janice on, on the point about um, <clears throat> what you want to accomplish, however you structure it. Um, uh, I did want to make uh, one other point, and now I'm forgetting it, so why don't you go ahead. Okay, well, let me ask you. I'm going to ask the first two. Well, I know what it was. Go ahead. You asked about it. There's not one thing you could do in a charter, and charters, you know, don't, it's people, a, a large part. But we may, I'll, I'll say here, probably for the first time publicly, we made a big mistake, I think, in one area of the charter, a small area. The three of the most important departments are the proprietary departments, the ones that run the airport, the, uh -huh. the water and power department, and the port. And... Um, I think that we need to go back in that area. Right now, they are appointed at the, uh, at, the, at the pleasure of the mayor and serve at the pleasure of the mayor. They should be appointed for, for terms that continue past the mayor or, you know, they, they ro rotate. Mm -hmm. they, they can't be mere instruments of the mayor. But I think the terms are staggered right now. But, you, the but no, but the mayor appoints them all all the, the mayor time. Appoints and them and all. they serve at the pleasure of the mayor. So the mayor at any one point. Tomorrow they're out. They're, so they basically do not have the comfort of independence mm -hmm. and independent judgment where they can make decisions. And it, it just puts too much political pressure on them. And the mayor would actually be better served, and they would be better served if, if he could have an excuse, in a sense. And he's got to pick the right people, and the council has got to vet them, something that the council has not yet, in my judgment, no, learned no. how to vet. They, they're afraid to vet appointments. Uh, they haven't learned that the way the <laughs> Congress has, where it's spooked in Congress if you're not going to appoint somebody who's qualified. Right. The other thing is you it's cannot fair. run But these people these aren't paid, though, so it's always tough to get. It's tough. Yeah, and you have to slap somebody down who's going to do a volunteer yeah, exactly. job. I'm, here, I'm, I'm about to give you 10, 15 hours a week for free, and you're, and yeah. you know. You know what? Here's I the agree. problem is right. 10 to 15 hours of a week from somebody who's not capable of doing the job is worse and, and, and to think that everyone can run a Department of Water and Power that's just the largest municipal water and power agency in the country yeah. can run it, just coming in and say, appoint me, it doesn't work. It's nice, it's wonderful to think that we all could do it, but this city, because of a lot of things, does not get the expertise right. of how to be a board member on a, on a very, very important agency 
and look at things you know, in, in a broad, broad way. So I'm not asking for business people to be put on there necessarily, but you just can't open it up and say, anybody can surf. And we've done that over the last 20 years, really, is we've been a little lax on who we think. We think everybody can be on there, uh, uh, and they can't. It's just not going to work, and we get some of, the, some of the problems we get because of that. So what would you suggest? I would suggest, first of all, that you, you got to give people terms so that they, somebody who goes on fired. there with any kind of... Yeah, but uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't answer the volunteer. No, but it's, it's the first part of it because somebody who does have that skill is not going to put themselves in a position simply to be a lackey of anybody else. They just don't want to be in that position. So you're going to increase the kinds of people that are... Then I think that the, the mayor, frankly, and the council have to talk about the level of appointments. Mm -hmm. Part of it is just going to be subliminal and attract people who have uh, various capacities to run things to be on those boards and balance those with community people. But right now, I, in, in my judgment, we do not have that. And I think people are less inclined to serve thinking that if they just buck the mayor, who I support strongly, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, you know, that they're in trouble. And nobody likes to be in that situation. Yeah. Um, the Charter of the City of Los Angeles is like the Constitution. Mm -hmm. When we had charter reform, it was like the Constitutional Convention. And Mr. George Kiefer was the head of that. Uh, if in six or in 06. He was 06, only the head of his. Wait, wait, let, me, let me just explain. For those who haven't read the book <laughs> and, and not having been on either, just showing you how, how silly and convoluted, <laughs> if not, well, I won't use other terms. We went through, we are going to create a new Constitution for the City of LA, and the city created an appointed commission, and each council member appointed a member. Because the they were afraid of the elected commission. The, the, the controller appointed one, the city attorney appointed one, et cetera, 21 members. Um, because some feared who those appointed were or that it was going to be, you know, to use George's term, political lackeys of the people appointed them, there was an effort by, to, by initiative to create, shall we, a, shall we elect a charter commission? The voters of the city said, yes, we, we shall elect a charter commission. And Janice and I, we had each, each district in the city elect its charter commissioner after we agreed that, yes, there shall be an elected charter commission. So, but we never got rid of the appointed one. So we, we in this city went through creating a new constitution and had two entities dealing with it. George was the uh, elected head of the appointed commission. Janice was one of 15 elected commissioners who also then elected Representing the, the people. And, and, but the two, to be fair, and you'll read the book, I don't want to spoil it, they came together. A lot of stress, a lot of tension, because both of them could have put a new constitution on the ballot, and the people would have had to read, do we like this one or do we like that one? And, I, and the powers that be the, the, the said, you know, we can't ask our, our citizens to try to understand what's in this one and what's in that one and which is good and what is good. So before anything went to the ballot, the two commissions spent many, many hours after each having done their own work to say, Let's compromise. Let's share a work. We both agree that a new system will be better for the city, and let's find a way to do that. So they came together and put one thing on the ballot, and that one thing was then elected. Cindy, you're really good. You just covered in two minutes. <laughs> and I don't read the book. Four <laughs> chapters. He's got to take it. So, um, let me ask you this question, George. In 06, if they have to, confer, have to put together another uh, uh, charter commission, and they ask you to serve, would you serve? No. <laughs> We're not, huh? So one, one more question, and then I'll open it up for the students. Uh, Cindy, your term, you're done on July 1st or June 1st? June 30th. June 30th is your last oh, day. It's hard to believe. Two questions. What are you going to do after, number one? And number two, is there anything you regret, or is there any promise that you were unable to fulfill, or is there anything on your agenda that you really, you're uh, kind of frustrated that you weren't able to get to? Uh, mostly it's just the lack of time. As I said, I was here in 1999 when the city was hard hit by the LAPD scan scandal of, of Rafael Perez and, and bad cops in LAPD doing bad things in, in this community. And I was part of let's create the consent decree and let's see in five years if we can make the changes under the auspices of a judge and the Department of Justice to make LAPD better. I will leave before that five years is up. and that. I regret because as chair of the Public Safety Committee and working an awful lot with the police department to help make those changes, you really put things in place, I won't be there to see the end of it. So it's more that at the end of time. And obviously, having just in December 
finally having gotten to the compromise and, and adoption of the city uh, of a new master plan at LAX. And it's not a master plan that says now it's done and go away. It's now implemented, it's carried out, it's got the components that Janice was talking about, not only the community benefits program, but a step-by-step -step requirement that there be stakeholders, whether it's the airlines or whether it's the next door neighbor, stakeholders have to be involved in every step of the way through the project. And that I won't be here to be part of that is disappointing. So in part, in answer to your question, I don't have a specific thing that I know I'm going to do after I leave, but I know I'm going to try to find something to do in LA and keep my hand in it in some way in those things that, that really matter a lot to me. I've, I've spent more than just the eight years as a council member for 22 years, I was a, a staff member to a city council member, right. so I've spent 30 years in city, city government in the city of Los Angeles, in City Hall, and that's in my blood. So I'll do something there, not elected. Questions, comments, suggestions? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. No, we need that actually for the recording, so it's not that we can't hear you. It's Sorry. Oh. My, my question is, uh, who bears that $60 million? Is it the port itself, or is it because they raise costs, who then it goes to the, to the, the transport companies, who, then the distributors, then the retailers, and then the consumer? It's port, it's port revenue. I mean, it's, it's the revenue that comes in for, for the port. And by the way, the, the Harbor Department in the Port of Los Angeles is – uh, you know, self-sustaining on its own. It is not uh, taxpayer dollars. It doesn't. It's not money that comes out of the the city of Los Angeles general fund. It is revenue that is generated by uh, the leases and the shipping companies, and it's a revenue that comes in in there. It's a billion dollar industry. But it was built though by bonds passed by the people who then uh, ended up paying some of those bonds way back historically. Nineteen hundred. Yeah. 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 And well, every port. Uh, in California is held in trust for the people of California. And each one of our ports is under um, the state Tidelands Trust document. And it's very interesting. Uh, these documents are negotiated with, with each port. So each port actually has a different document. But when we talk about the FAA being, being controlling in terms of how the money sometimes is spent at the airport, um, the Tidelands Trust document in the state of California is a very interesting document, uh, but it, it uh, limits and regulates how the port can spend their revenue, which is why it's difficult to get some of that money spent in the community. Uh, it must be spent on commerce, uh, maritime, they can be fisheries. Yes, well, actually, um, we, uh, at the, we had legislation that tweaked it a bit to say that the money could be used for educational, tourist, and, uh, related, and related activities. But even that $60 million, which is I'm having a fight right now with the state Thailand's, uh, even that $60 million is has to go through the state Thailand's commission. The commission in the state of California is made up of the lieutenant governor, the controller, and the director of finance uh, in the governor's office. Uh, they sit on the state Thailand's commission, but they have a staff of bureaucrats uh, that decides everything. So I'm in a fight with them practically weekly on how we can spend our money down there. Uh, but for instance, we think a good mitigation for bad air, trucks, pollution, you know, just kind of a crummy quality of life is to build two parks. One in Wilmington, which is probably the most underserved area of Los Angeles in terms of open yeah, space and park, and San Pedro, uh, because when people come into San Pedro, it's this horrible kind of entryway, and it's very industrial, and, and it's polluted and blighted, and again, you have to fight trucks to get off the freeway. We think uh, You're describing the city you live in. I know, I know, I know. And we think a nice welcome park with a water feature and uh, would be a nice thing with San Pedro and a nice park in Wilmington. Well, the state Tidelands uh, Commission wrote me back and said no. So wait, so how are we going to spend the $60 million? And who's That's kind of what I said. I go, how, we have, we have, you know, how do we spend this money? Well, one of the things I'm trying to do is I think we're going to work through this, but uh, I think that uh, money that was a, it was a settlement, a stipulated judgment settlement 
uh, should be different than how port revenue is spent on a regular basis. This was a judgment, this was a settlement uh, awarded to the people of San Pedro and Wilmington because of a badly behaving port. That shouldn't be subject right. to the regular, uh, and it's only 60 million, once it's gone, it's gone. But it sh I think it should have been taken differently, let the Harbor Commission decide how they want to spend that money. So. I don't know so if that answers the question. Been, it hasn't been decided, basically, is what you're saying. Right, but we're going to spend it, and they've told us no. Uh, I told the Harbor Commission yes. Uh, so they're going to spend the money, and we'll wait and see if uh, we get sued. Yeah. <laughs> Over here. Go ahead. 